So I guess maybe we'll get started. Uh, if you have questions, you can raise your hand in Zoom and you'll be recognized, or you can type questions in the chat box and I'll monitor it and then warn Monty if there are interesting questions in the chat box. And <clears throat> so it's my pleasure to introduce Monty Costlywall, even though she's local, I guess the new tradition is to still introduce local speakers. So Monty got her bachelor's degree in engineering physics at Cornell in 2004 and then she had the good sense to come to Caltech as a graduate student in astronomy. Um, I had her in the first year of classes and it was very clear then that she was very bright and very enthusiastic. Uh, she started work on trying to map dark matter using ground-based weak lensing data. Uh, unfortunately, I was successful in convincing her not to waste her time on that, but instead to switch advisors uh, and start working with my colleague Sri Kulkarni who had this newly constructed toy called the Palomar Transient Factory. Uh, so Monsi did that very spectacularly, uh, seemed to never sleep and was re recording events all night, got her PhD in 2011 using the PTF data to search for fast transients and faint transients, well, such as explosions on white dwarfs, uh, fast supernovae, gamma ray burst afterglows, and hunting for signals from merging neutron stars. Um, after her PhD, she was a Hubble Carnegie Princeton fellow, triple barreled, um, and she worked on calcium rich supernovae and then started moving from optical transients to infrared transients. She led a big Spitzer Space Telescope program on searching for infrared transients, such as merging main sequence stars. And then we were lucky enough to get her back on the Caltech faculty in 2015. And she's continued to work on electromagnetic counterparts of LIGO events and building her own facilities for infrared transit surveys. And she'll tell us about those today. Uh, along the way, she got a Packard Fellowship in 2018 and she's been the PI of a NSF project called Growth. And so Monsi, infrared transients. Thank you so much, Stil, for this very kind and generous introduction. Um, it's so nice to see um, all of you, um, if, if not in the empty chairs in front of me, at least on Zoom uh, briefly. Uh, so thank you for coming today and hearing an update uh, from me on the research uh, that I've been doing in the last few years. Um, the last time I was in Feynman Lecture Hall was five and a half years ago. And just for fun, I was looking back at those slides and I was just telling Sol it felt a little bit like ancient history um, because there's been so much progress um, in the field as a whole um, that I'd love to share a piece of it with you today. Um, before I go further, um, I just want to show um, the faces of the graduate students and postdocs in my group. Uh, the top row is my current group. The bottom row are recent graduates. And uh, throughout uh, this talk, I'll be crediting their contributions. Uh, this mentoring them has really been the best part about being back at Caltech. Um, so let me begin with the landscape for multi-messenger astrophysics. Um, and five years ago, uh, at the last PRC, um, multi-messenger astrophysics, as you all know, is uh, uh, combining information from at least two messengers. So any two of electromagnetic waves, gravitational waves, um, high energy neutrinos, cosmic rays, um, just taking any information from any two messengers. And five years ago, the only two examples we had was neutrinos from the sun and uh, the supernova 1987A, which was not, which is now more than three decades ago. Um, and in the last few years, um, uh, the gravitational wave interferometer sensitivity, thanks to the fantabulous work by many of you on, on the Zoom line today, the members of the LIGO Virgo collaboration, um, has just been amazing. The dozens of um, black holes that have been uh, discovered at all types of masses, expected and even unexpected. And uh, the very textbook on stellar mass black holes is being rewritten. Um, but closest to my heart, of course, are these two orange dots that you see here that merged to form that, that black hole, that binary neutron star merger on August 17, 2017, lit up the entire electromagnetic spectrum in, uh, in a manner just nothing else had. And, um, and I will certainly tell you more about, about that today. But I also wanted to point out another multi-messenger candidate, which is at, right at the top of this diagram. It, it is the most massive merger. And Matthew Graham from this Wiki Transient Facility uh, led a paper proposing a candidate counterpart, um, a flare in the disk of an EGN 
um, for this one. Um, and that was published in PRL uh, last year. And uh, on the high energy neutrino side too, there's been some sizzling excitement. Um, there are two events, one in 2017, September 22nd, where there was a blazar that flared um, and is considered to be, uh, at least proposed to be associated with the high energy neutrinos. And just last month, uh, this Wiki transient facility um, in a paper led by graduate student Robert Stein from DESI um, suggested a tidal disruption flare. So a star coming really close to a, and getting uh, tidally ripped by a supermassive black hole as a potential counterpart to uh, the ice cube 0.2 PEV neutrino uh, in uh, 2019, October 1st. Um, so we have two, and there's actually a third one uh, that I'm not allowed to say anything about yet. Um, there is an, a third candidate that, that we are investigating. So this field of multi-messenger astrophysics is, is really growing. Um, every couple of years, there seems to be a breakthrough uh, right now. So it's really fun to work in this field. And simultaneously, um, there's, in the landscape for time domain astronomy, at just about every wavelength, there has been a lot of progress as well. And I'll just give you a couple of examples, not an exhaustive review here. Um, and let's start with the longest wavelengths. And for that, I saw Greg and Vikram join. So if you tune into their excitement at Avans Valley Radio Observatory for all of five minutes, you'll realize how amazing LWA DSA 110, their dream to take it up to DSA 2000 is for the transient radio sky. On the X-ray side, um, just uh, recently, the uh, Russian uh, German satellite SRG was launched. And that's 30 times more sensitive and faster mapping than its predecessor, ROSAT, from a few decades ago. So, and then now I want to take you to the middle of the spectrum. Um, and still mentioned my thesis project, the Palma Transient Factory. Uh, my thesis advisor, Sri, has now turned up the volumetric mapping speed by another order of magnitude. And many of us in the audience today are enjoying uh, the fruits of the Zwicky Transient Facility, including transient discoveries, stellar, uh, stellar variables, uh, solar system objects, et cetera. Um, so today, um, I'd like to focus the rest of the talk on uh, this piece of the electromagnetic spectrum, the infrared piece, um, one micron to 10 micron to be specific, um, because in my mind, uh, there's tremendous scientific potential in, the, in this piece of the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, yes, it has hitherto been relatively less explored, um, but there is a way to open it up and um, open our eyes to infrared time domain. And that's what I want to illustrate to you um, has just started and there's, there's, there's many fun things happening in this arena. So let me explain, and this will be how the rest of the talk is organized. Um, so let me explain why the infrared is scientifically interesting. Um, and today I'll focus on three reasons, there's more, but let, today let's just start with three reasons. Um, the first is uh, dust extinction. Um, so if you want to study uh, the magnificent um, stellar events in our own Milky Way galaxy, uh, so you don't even want to go too far out to other galaxies, just in the Milky Way itself, um, it turns out that extinction due to the dust along the line of sight is a big problem. For every kiloparsec, there's a magnitude of visual extinction. So if you want to find all the classical novae, all the white dwarf mergers, young stellar outbursts, microlensing events, or even if there's a galactic supernova, it might be very difficult to find it in the optical or ultraviolet wave bands. Um, so it helps to go uh, to wavelengths longer than the size of the dust particle um, to really be sensitive to, um, to uh, these types of astrophysical events. And um, for similar reasons, um, it's not just the dust, uh, interstellar dust that the infrared helps you overcome, but also um, self-enshrouded events. And I'll show you uh, a picture a visual for a stellar merger and overcoming the dust that is created during the stellar merger process or during um, an explosive event. Um, the infrared is again, a very handy uh, piece of the electromagnetic spectrum to, to probe that um, type of um, explosion. And third, for the multi-messenger enthusiasts in the room, um, I, I will work through a little bit of bound bound opacity and uh, the peak of the emission from these binary neutron star mergers and neutron star black hole mergers that LIGO Virgo is not discovering completely routinely, um, the peak of the emission there too is in the infrared. And this is entirely due to fundamental bound bound opacity reasons. 
Um, and so far, we haven't had a sensitive probe of uh, mapping these large areas and searching, discovering in the infrared directly. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit more about my plans for O4 and beyond um, for that. Um, so if the science is so rich, and I've only given you three examples, there are many more, um, then why has this um, taken so long to, to get going? And uh, there have been two challenges that have um, sort of um, put astronomers, um, put the internet in the backseat for some astronomers, and that is um, the very practical, very boring reasons. And um, the two reasons have been the cost of detectors. They're just extremely expensive. They've not benefited from um, Moore's law and um, that, that we've seen in silicon. And with ZTF, we have entire wafer scale devices, 16 of them. We can have silicon the size of a photographic plate. None of that is, um, is imaginable or affordable right now um, in the infrared. Um, and the second is that um, the infrared wavebands in the night sky from the ground for any ground-based project is just much higher. Um, so that dominates the noise budget and the sensitivity. So the approach I took to try to get to the science that I really um, I'm excited about is to just try to solve one piece of the challenge at a time and take a very slow and steady phased approach. And then I'll tell you at the very end how I want to do it all in one go. But right now, we'll just take one piece of this at a time and see what we learn about the dynamic infrared sky as we go. So I'm going to begin with the first one, which is our own Milky Way galaxy, the science I'm after. And here, no, no fancy te uh, hardware technology, but just software algorithms. And let me tell you how. So the visual I want you to keep at the back of your mind is something like this. We take an image of a random piece of the Milky Way. In this case, it appears to be a dark blob, nothing exciting happening there. In the visible light, you take an image with a Spitzer Space Telescope. And in the infrared, there's a young um, star launching a protostellar jet, right? So it's all a matter of which wavelength you look in, whether you, you see the fun or not. Um, so in order to do uh, the Milky Way, I need a wide field of view, right? And as I was just mentioning in the optical, there's a whole armada of facilities um, with all different, um, from a few square degrees to order 10 square degrees, like the Rubin Observatory to this Wiki transient facility at 50 square degrees. Uh, the, the Andromeda galaxy just fits in one ship and the moon is just tiny uh, in comparison, right? Uh, you can fit 230 full moons there. Um, in the infrared, when I joined Caltech in 2015, the biggest camera was the Vista camera. So it's a European facility um, in Chile. Um, this camera is excellent, but it's only 0 0.6 square degrees. There's no way to map the Milky Way night after night with that, that size of a camera. And this is an extremely expensive facility too. Um, so how do we make the jump from Vista to Palomar Gattini IR? You have to give up something. You can't have, have it all, right? So, so the parameter that we were willing to give up is spatial resolution. So we decided, um, and this was in collaboration with Anna Moore. Uh, she was actually at Caltech um, until recently, and now she's a professor and director at the Australian National University. And what we did was, you'll see at the back of this, um, uh, the th a 30 centimeter uh, telescope, uh, which is a very small telescope, but with a very fast um, focal ratio. So this fast focal ratio gives us a wide angle um, at the back of it. Um, and in the focal plane, all we put is um, an off-the-shelf 2K by 2K detector, 2048 pixels by 2048 pixels in the standard Mercury Cadmium Telluride uh, technology. In fact, this was a spare detector that um, just happened to be in Roger Smith's desk drawer. Um, and uh, we could put this at the back of this very fast focal ratio uh, telescope and get this whopping 25 square degree field of view. Now, pixels each pixel was 8.4 arc seconds. So that's very big. Um, so we were getting a lot of sky and a lot of stars in each of those pixels. Um, so a real challenge, if as we now map uh, 15,000 square degrees every two nights, that's pretty much the entire accessible uh, sky um, on a given night and every two nights um, to J band of 16th mag. Our challenge is the software. How do we find infrared uh, transients in these very coarse, um, these sampled images. Um, and the answer is that if you have a bright graduate student, any, anything's possible. Um, it also helps to have a collaborator like Iran Offerk in this case, who's an algorithms expert. 
And what we did was for every image that we took, and here I'm giving you a particularly difficult example, right in the plane of our galaxy. Uh, this is the location of SGR 1935, a galactic past radio burst uh, discovered by Chris Bocernik as part of the Caltech Stair 2 project, and also independently by the CHIME collaboration. Um, this is one of the densest regions, right? And, and the pixels are so big that 8.4 arc seconds means you have many, many stars in each pixel. Um, but even in such crowded regions, we are able to subtract different sea images. Um, and uh, there are two things we do normally. In this case, we actually didn't even do that first step, which is that when we go to a point in the field, we did the eight times. And when we did the eight times, uh, the starlight leaks to different neighbors in each of those pointings. So we can use that information to reconstruct, resample the, the point spread function and get better spatial uh, localization than the native one that you would get for your eight arc seconds pixels. So we can get positions down to about even half arc second for, for bright sources um, using that method. And then uh, thanks to Iran Offic, my collaborator at Weizmann Institute, um, we use um, an image subtraction method that's um, you know, tried and tested on, um, on PTF and now runs full time on ZTF and is also going to be part of Rubin, which is a, an algorithm called Zogi to do the image subtraction um, mathematically optimally. And even in very tough regions, we get relatively clean difference images. Um, in this particular case, we were observing um, SGR 1935 at the same time as an X-ray satellite, HXMT. That one saw four bursts in X-rays, but in that same, um, at the same time, in, in a 0.84 second exposure, we did not see anything in the infrared. So what we're able to do is constrain the spectral slope. Um, so there's a radio detection, there's an X-ray detection, you can make a simple line between the two points, but that might not be your answer if uh, given these um, infrared uh, non-detections for subsequent flares of SGR 1935. Um, we used one more trick um, to actually get this data uh, because we are pushing down to 0.84 seconds. We were pushing down to um, an exposure time where we would be very inefficient for a normal H2RG detector readout. Um, because normally the way you read out these infrared detectors, you'll go, you'll take your science exposure, you'll read that out, you'll reset the frame, you'll read that out, and then you'll continue on to your next science exposure. So, you're, so for very short exposures, it's about 50% inefficient. inefficient. Um, so um, again, thanks to Roger Smith and, and David Hale at Caltech Optical Observatories, um, they developed a method for us by which we could read out this, um, reset the, uh, the detector line by line. So we could get more than 99% efficiency because suddenly your, your uh, efficiency improved by one over the total number of rows. Um, so that helped us get um, uh, very nice data on this particular event. But normally this is not um, uh, relevant because we take um, eight, eight, eight second exposures um, at any given pointing. So let me give you another example um, of what is it that we see that is brightest in the infrared transient sky. Um, so here I give you a couple of examples of warping bright transients. So you see uh, the image we took tonight minus the image from um, as, that we call ref, which is reference, and then the subtraction image. And um, I'm not sure if you can all see my cursor, but um, this bright transient here, right, there's nothing in the reference image. You can see something really bright in the new image or something you can identify by eye if you wanted to. <laughs> by eye because it's so, so bright. These are things that are 10th, 11th, 12th magnitude in the infrared um, wave bands. The same event, in this case, these are all classical novae in our own galaxy. Um, the same event is um, a factor of 100 times fainter. So this is in, um, in uh, magnitude uh, space here. Uh, so fact five magnitude is a factor of 100 in, in flux. Um, so with ZTF, these are much, much fainter and much harder to find. Um, than with Gatini, where they're just so bright in the infrared, all because of the dust between us and the classical nova. So um, this is the te technique by which we find them. Um, now, what, what is a classical nova and why is it so exciting to double the rate of um, discovery of classical novae? Um, a classical nova is a white dwarf with a companion, and, um, and is, that is accreting material from its companion. When it accretes enough material that is able to exceed uh, the critical pressure for thermonuclear runaway, uh, then you have some burning on the surface of the white dwarf. 
And this burning is so brilliant that um, the white dwarf can become nearly a million times as bright as the sun. Um, and so uh, that burning, that flash is called a classical nova. Um, and uh, by um, searching for classical nova directly in the infrared, not being affected, not bothering by the dust, we were able to dis double the discovery rate of classical novae. Um, and in this nice picture that graduate student Kishale uh, Day made, um, you can see a map of, the, of our galaxy. It's now color coded. So you can ignore the yellow part, this thing, this is the Southern quadrant that we can't see from Palomar. The rest of it is a mass weighted extinction map. So uh, the, most of the mass is actually where the darkest spots in, this, in, the, in the diagram are but they're also the most extincted. Um, so before Gatini, before Palmar Gatini IR, um, if you combine uh, discoveries of classical novae over a long time, many years, decades, um, then you get this um, blue uh, dots from the literature. And it's somewhat puzzling that these blue dots don't trace the mass, right? I mean, they should, most of the white dwarfs should be where the mass is. So these dots, these discoveries should trace the mass and there should be more in the plane than people were previously finding. Um, now with Gatini, we've not been running for decades. We've only been running since July of 2019. Um, so in the first 17 months, we found um, these classical novae shown by the stars in the, in the diagram. And you can see these, these actually very nicely trace um, the darkest regions in this diagram. So they are actually sensitive to where the mass is in this galaxy. And this is, I mean, this is how it should be. And I saw Bob Williams join the call. So in his, in his words, and this is the email he sent us when he, when we sent, when he saw the draft of the paper, um, is that this, this is what one would expect. And this is where you would expect extincted novae to be. So if you could now convert this distribution of classical novae into an extinction distribution. So this is cumulative fraction versus extinction. Um, and the literature sample, the blue dots that you saw before, are this, are this um, defined by this gray line. And the Gatini uh, novae are offset from that. They're more extinct than, than these. And they are shown by yellow and red, depending on the details of exactly how the extinction is measured um, through photometric colors or through spectroscopy. And the best part is that they actually, if you inject novae into this um, mass map of the galaxy and you try to recover them, then they're consistent with um, the simulated extinction, um, uh, cumulative distribution of extinction that you may expect from um, the, uh, the, what we know about the distribution of mass in our own galaxy. So that's, that's progress, that's step one. Uh, now step two is how well do we understand our own um, pipeline? Like, I mean, that we don't, we can't discover novi on every night. It's raining on some nights, so we may miss some. Um, we don't discover novae when they are in the sun, we don't discover when they're too close to the sun, and we won't discover them if they are too close to the moon, and we won't discover them if they're too far down south. Um, so if we make all these corrections, inject fake novae into our pipeline, see all of our software inefficiencies, um, pipeline inefficiencies, and, and see how many we detect again, uh, we can actually infer a rate of classical novae, and that's exactly what um, Kishale did. And um, what he found was that the rate of classical novae in the Milky Way should be something like 46 plus or minus 13 per year. So we could do this very systematically. Um, we didn't have to make um, wild extrapolations or big assumptions. Um, previous efforts had either had to assume the Milky Way is like other galaxies and extrapolate from other galaxies to the Milky Way or take the brightest novae where we know that no matter whether dust or otherwise, we, would, we, we are still at least finding the ones in our immediate neighborhood and extrapolating from that to the full distribution. Um, here we could take the measured distribution, no extrapolations, and just convert that to a rate. Um, so that was really fun. And this was um, you know, the, the final chapter in Kishale's thesis. And he's going to be defending his, his thesis on, on Monday. Um, so uh, that will be fun. Um, let me give you another example now of what we can do um, in the Milky Way galaxy if we have uh, a surveyor like Gatini. And here now I give you an example, not of an explosive transient, but of a variable star. Um, and the variable star in particular are um, what, what astronomers like to call our core bore stars. Um, so they are called, um, called our core bore because the prototype was discovered in the crown-shaped constellation of Corona Borealis. 
Um, and uh, I saw Professor Lars Wilson join the call and um, these, these uh, and he encouraged me to look for these in the Gattini data because they have very characteristic light curves. So they have these dips by, uh, by several magnitudes and then they stay in this, um, in this faint state for hundreds of days. And you can see a few different examples um, of them. And they're thought to be um, white work merger products and actually more and more evidence is pointing to that being the correct explanation. And these dips in the light curve are likely on account of just dust being dredged up. Uh, so in some sense, this is also self-enshrouding in addition to the line of sight um, uh, extinction that um, could make them difficult to find in, in optical surveys. Um, so using the Gattini um, light curves database, um, graduate student Viraj has been able to identify 149 new r core bow candidates and another 150 or so looking at the color, uh, colors of these events. And what he's doing now as we speak, he's just started on this, this particular project, is he's taking spectra with the Palomar 200 inch telescope that has a spec, the triple spec spectrograph. Um, but he's taking infrared spectra of these um, r core bow stars. And he's measuring the, the O16 over O18 ratio um, for in these uh, particular events. And you may ask why O16 over O18? I mean, those are the lines we see, CO16 over CO18. Um, but O18 is very useful because O18 is very sensitive to temperature. So the two uh, theoretical models that people um, debate between, one is final flash and the other is this wide work merger uh, product. And the white work merger, merger products are lower temperature. So, uh, so you have much less O18 uh, than you would in um, the other scenario. So the O16 over uh, O18 ratios are much smaller um, uh, here than in uh, sun-like stars or other stars by orders of magnitude. So uh, the growing evidence is that, um, uh, that uh, our core stars are indeed white work merger products, but we've we still have a lot more spectra to take. This is just the, the first step. So we will have more serious um, histograms in by the end of the year. Um, now, I'd like to give you a third example of um, science from Gattini. Uh, and for this one, actually, I want to tell you about um, uh, graduate student Samapon Tinyanon's PhD thesis. Um, I co-advised him with Dimitri. And with Dimitri's research group, he built a near infrared spect uh, pole instrument, spectro spectropolarimeter instrument, on top of the work instrument that we have at the prime focus of the 200 inch. And the picture that you see here is actually the prime focus of the Palma 200 inch telescope. And what we were trying to do here is observe very nearby supernovae. So the same supernovae that were bright enough for Gattini to detect in our very local universe. Um, observe those with, with work pole um, to try to understand the geometry of these supernovae. And what's cool about infrared polarization is that um, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, false positive is a very difficult measurement to make. Um, there's like at the few percent level. Um, so often when you're doing optical polarization measurements, um, you get stuck because there's all these sources of noise from interstellar dust that mess up the signal. So it's hard to figure out whether it's intrinsic to the source, the polarization you're seeing, or whether it's something unrelated along the line of sight. Um, and the infrared, uh, nicely, is not as sensitive to all the other stuff between us and the supernova. So um, you're able to make the measurements more precisely. And thanks to this work pole um, choice of resolution um, and sensitivity, um, there, there were about um, half a dozen uh, supernovae that were close enough um, in one year uh, to observe with, with work pole. And um, uh, in a recent paper, uh, the, the student published um, a few percent polarization and inferred the geometry, so the ratio of B over A, uh, to be um, what, what you see in the diagram here. And this particular supernova happened to also be a supernova 1987A-like blue supergiant. Okay, that was a whirlwind of many different uh, science topics with, uh, uh, with uh, Palmar Gattini IR. I could keep going because we are just having so much fun with the data. Uh, I refer you to two more papers that are on archive. Uh, uh, Lynn has written a nice paper about an, a young star outburst from nephew Ori star. And my former postdoc, Ryan Lau, just posted a paper on a Wolfried binary, it's massive star Wolfried binary, which using the Gattini data is able to infer a 300 day period. 
And there are many other projects um, that I won't read out, uh, but uh, just for completeness, um, it's been really fun to open up our eyes to um, wide field infrared imaging. Um, so let, are there any questions? Okay, I assume not. Um, so uh, let's keep going here. Uh, now I'd like to go to part two, um, which is thinking about self-enshrouded events um, and mitigating this in the simplest possible way, which is mitigating sky background, just go into space. You don't have to worry about it at all then. And uh, for that, um, uh, let me give you a visual again for self-obscuration. And here I show you a sequence of images taken by Howard Bond with the Hubble Space Telescope over many years. Um, what you're seeing here is wave three at Mon, uh, which is thought to be um, two massive stars merging um, into one star. And this process, again, is extremely dusty, and you can see the dust surrounding it and expanding out in this, in this animation. Um, and even though uh, most stellar mergers used to be discovered, again, by optical surveys, uh, it would be much easier to just get past all of this uh, self enshrouded material by searching for them directly in the infrared. And for this, we need a lot of sensitivity. And uh, the sensitivity um, uh, we used this with the Space Telescope. It is one of NASA's four great observatories and uh, exquisitely sensitive. Only problem is that um, the camera has a very small field of view. So it has a five arc minute by five arc minute field of view. So what we did to work around that was in, instead of mapping these huge thousands of square degrees every, every night, we were just targeting individual galaxies as they became visible um, in the L2 orbit of, of Spitzer. So with cadence baselines of maybe a week to, to um, six months or so, and, and then several years, um, the Spitzer attack was kind enough to give us um, 1700 hours of time to really do a systematic search of about 200 galaxies in, a, in the local universe. So these are 200 galaxies where you know the Messiaen, so the nearest, brightest, most star forming, most massive galaxies. Um, and we were looking at them to very nice depths of 19th mag at 4.5 micron and 20th mag at 3.6 micron. So this was the subject of the PhD thesis of Jacob Jensen. And what we found with this is um, that to represent, just summarize all the findings from uh, the, the uh, spirit survey, um, what, what I'm showing you here is um, infrared luminosity as a function of time. And you see classical novae down here in blue. Um, you see supernovae, core collapse supernovae here. Uh, a type 1a supernova is very well behaved. That's in blue here. And interacting supernovae, supernovae that have a lot of circumstellar material interaction are shown up here. And this is 2014, before I joined Caltech. This is what the, the picture looked like. Um, now, as, uh, as part of Jacob's thesis, uh, this diagram um, uh, with the spirits data transformed into something like this. Um, each star here represents a discovery um, by the Spitzer Space Telescope of a mid-infrared um, transient at, uh, in this case, at 4.5 micron. And uh, many of these, um, many of the things we found were known supernovae. We were just seeing infrared emission sometimes years, maybe decades later even. Uh, some of these were extremely obscured supernovae. So it, there was one in particular uh, that was in Messier 108, only eight megaparsec away, uh, that was extincted by 12 magnitudes. So even though it was in our, in our backyard, so to speak, uh, it was something that we could not find from ground-based optical searches. Um, but Spitzer could, uh, was sensitive to all supernovae because of being at 4.5 micron instead of um, half a micron. Um, so uh, what Jacob inferred as part of his, his thesis was that we were missing a half, and he would never say half, he would say 38.5% uh, with those error bars, um, supernovae in our, in our backyard. Um, the other, um, other than these supernovae, which we were able to confirm with radio data, keg data, et cetera, um, what we found were transients that were sort of intermediate in luminosity. And just for fun, we have the kooky acronym called Sprites for them. But these intermediate luminosity transients, some of them were extincted novae, um, but some of them were likely enshrouded, self-enshrouded stellar mergers, which is what we had set out to, to look for in the, in the first place. Um, we don't have definitive proof of that, spectroscopic proof of that. Well, in one case, you have a small hydrogen line. 
Um, but we don't have definitive spectroscopic proof of that because Switzer was warm and did not no longer had the infrared spectrograph built by Jim Houck on aboard it. Um, but four of these targets, I'm happy to report, is been approved to be observed by the James Webb Space Telescope in cycle one. So if, if JWST launches October 31st, we might finally know whether what we found with, with spirits was in fact um, self-enshrouded cell emergers. But one thing was sure, I mean, just 200 galaxies and we were seeing a wealth of um, infrared transients. So, so um, I was very motivated to keep pushing the boundaries here to, um, to open up the infrared in, in, a, in a bigger way with, with wide field imaging. So now I'd like to go um, to part three of the talk. Um, and I think, um, I'm not sure if there was a question or not, but uh, there's something that popped up. Um, okay, um, I don't think that was a question. Um, so let's keep going um, to part three, which is opacity. So the third reason, which has nothing to do with dust whatsoever, is um, that uh, when we talk about um, heavy elements being nuclear, uh, nuclear synthesized by the R process, which is R, where R stands for the rapid capture of free neutrons, uh, when, as these, when these heavy elements form, um, you, uh, you would start to see, um, and they radioactively decay, and then that is what we're trying to detect with our telescope, there are millions of possible line transitions. Um, and let me, let me explain that a little bit more. I actually have, I wrote, I wrote it up on the blackboard, right? So think about your SPDF shells, think about your Ls of 0, 1, 2, 3, your Gs of, of 2, 6, 10, 14. Um, and then think about your G factorial divided by N factorial uh, divided by G minus N factorial, right? So this number becomes very large when you're starting to synthesize lanthanide um, and heavier elements in the periodic table. So if you have millions of line transitions that that possible electron could go to, uh, the resultant opacity, the bound bound opacity is not just 0 0.4 centimeter square per gram that, that, we, that we know and love from, from Thompson opacity, but it's more like 10 centimeters square per gram. So the peak of the emission is shifted out of the optical bands into the infrared bands. So if we want to do multi-messenger astrophysics and find these neutron star mergers and neutron star black hole merger counterparts, we need a sensitive wide field infrared imager. And we had very good proof that all this theory was actually correct in the majestic gravitational wave event from August 17, 2017. Um, now, this was an event that um, has been studied by 3,000 astronomers and physicists and 77 telescopes around the world collected data on this event. Um, I'm just going to tell you a small piece of that story here, not, not, not attempt an exhaustive review. And the small pieces of the story that um, I will uh, just briefly touch on one is, um, uh, the, this is based on the papers that the growth collaboration that Stir mentioned um, right at the beginning um, put together. One on the right, you see a cocoon model uh, that was developed by uh, Udi Nagar and the simulation you see here is by his graduate student or Gottlieb from Tel Aviv University. And you see kinematics and energetics. And um, the idea here was that when two neutron stars merge and launch that ultra relativistic narrow jet, um, they also transfer energy into the surrounding material and launch a wide angle, mildly relativistic, so Lorentz factor of few to 10 instead of a Lorentz factor of 100, cocoon. And when this cocoon breaks out, the gamma rays are much lower luminosity, as we saw. And the radio and X-ray are much delayed, as, but, but they do exist and they do come online if you're persistent and patient like, like Greg and Alessandra were. Um, and um, they were detected nine days later. And once the radio lights up and the X-rays light up, they, that light curve just keeps going for a few hundred days. Um, and that's, that was a prediction of this, this model that was borne out by, by the data. But I'm going to not try not to tell you too much more about the jet physics here and focus again on the nucleosynthesis and on the origin of the heavy elements. So um, this was done with uh, an international group of 17 institutions. Uh, it was a partnership in international research and education. Um, and uh, the members of this collaboration were from eight different countries. And um, here's uh, the set of three papers that we wrote right on the day the embargo was lifted and then many more papers after that. Um, I think there are 
thousands of people now on this one event um, in just the last three years. So it's, um, it's a gift that keeps giving, uh, as my collaborator Samaya Nisanki would say. And um, let's focus now on just one piece of it, which is the nucleosynthesis. So once again, I show you the periodic table. Um, red, as all of you know, is hydrogen and helium from the Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Blue is uh, light and dark blue, are the two flavors of supernovae. Um, uh, and massive stars and uh, telefusion. So that, that, that covers the first few rows. It's the elements that are heavier than iron and half of them heavier than iron that are shown in yellow here uh, that were predicted decades ago to be synthesized by our process nucleosynthesis. But it took until 2017 to actually see direct evidence of this. And the way we saw evidence of our process nucleosynthesis was in um, the, the hallmark rapid reddening of the light curves. So here you see the light curve put together by the growth team and the many, many other uh, light curve contributions from all the different telescopes and teams that I cite on the right. Um, but the ultraviolet just faded in a, in a few hours. The optical faded in a few days. The infrared lasted for a few weeks. So this hallmark rapid reddening due to the high bound bound opacity of the material was the first clue that, that this was our process nucleosynthesis in action. Um, and the second clue was that if you look at a spectroscopic sequence, um, this is from the VLT telescope, and you can see everything from that we can access from the ground um, at one day cadence. What starts off as a very bright and blue transient has these very broad features, unlike any other transient we've ever seen before, uh, which, and these broad features represent high velocities as well as the blending of many different lines um, in the spectrum. And there's an ongoing debate till today of exactly which elements were synthesized and in what, what um, proportion. So all these teams, I listed a whole list of um, different papers there. They agree on one thing, they disagree on many things, but they agree on one thing, that somewhere between 0.04 to 0.05 solar masses of heavy elements were synthesized. And, um, and that would be enough if the rate was something like 500 per gigaparsec cube per year, that would be enough to explain the solar abundance. What is much debated is which of the heavy elements was made. Was it only elements in the first peak? Was it elements in the second, third peak? So on the left, you see the solar R process abundance as a function of the atomic mass. And this is in, in log units. Um, uh, so it's actually, most of it is in the, in the first peak, even in our local solar uh, neighborhood. But if you now take this color coding of different um, atomic mass ranges, and you plot the fraction of electron heating as a function of time, uh, this was a figure made by Kenta Hotokazaka. Um, you can see the, that the green line um, is um, the lightest of the heavy elements, um, the first peak elements. And that line dominates in the first three weeks or first month after merger, and then it crashes. And all this data from the 77 telescopes and the large number of teams and all of the papers that I just mentioned, right? They all had data only in the first three weeks after merger, because after that, the target just went too close to the sun and was not accessible and also became really faint um, to uh, do any sort of photometry beyond that. So all that information was, was from the, uh, the first few weeks. And that first, first few weeks cannot disentangle the difference between first peak only and elements that were heavier than that. Um, so what we did, thanks to um, uh, director's discretionary time on the Spitzer Space Telescope, is um, Spitzer, again, thanks to its orbit, was able to look very close to the sun. And uh, it was able to observe uh, GW170817 at very late, impossible times for every other optical infrared uh, UV telescope, right? And this was at 43 days and 74 days after merger. And this red dot that you see here, where we've modeled out the galaxy light, and, and then here you just see everything subtracted except for um, the, the uh, transient itself. Uh, this here is light at 4.5 micron from GW170817 at very late time. And the only way this is possible, if you go back to, uh, to this figure here, is if you have some contribution from the heaviest of the heavy elements. Um, so uh, in particular, um, there are eight elements that we can narrow this down based on their half-lives. Uh, and these eight elements I circle um, in, in red here. 
um, that could power those, those two photometric points that we have at lead time as evidence for formation of the heaviest of the heavy elements by our process. Okay, um, so I think I've spent many minutes on GW170017. I could give entire hours and hours on it, but, but let's, let's move, move forward uh, to 2019. Uh, so we let's skip ahead to LIGO Virgo's third observing run, where um, they went offline for a bit and then came online with renewed uh, sensitivity. And in this new sensitivity mode that they ran on for about 11 months before um, the pandemic closed things uh, down, uh, there were 13 triggers that were sent out in real time to the astronomy community that uh, had uh, five of them had a binary neutron star merger and eight of them had or possibly neutron star black hole mergers. And this was from based on the quick analysis. This was not their final answer. Um, and, uh, but in, based on the quick analysis, there were these 13 triggers. And because they had better sensitivity than they did in the first two observing runs, uh, the median distance for these um, 13 triggers was 200 to 350 megaparsecs. Um, but what was the most challenging part actually for us was that um, the localizations were very, very coarse. Um, some of them were only detected by one or two interferometers, not all three. Um, so the localization, the median localization for these 13 triggers in the first um, uh, alert that they sent out was 4,480 square degrees. This was two orders of magnitude larger than GW170817, which was 40 square degrees and 40 megaparsecs, right? So much small, much further away and much more coarsely localized. Um, the good news um, was that um, between O2 O2 and O3, uh, we had commissioned this wiki transient facility, which had this very large field of view camera. And you see a movie here of uh, one of the this is 2001.05 AE for the aficionados, but one of the localizations that we are mapping with, with the Zwicky transient facility and the order in which we're mapping it in two filters, at least twice, if not, um, if, if you can fit it in, in a sequence of a few hours in the night before sunrise. And because of the large field of view, the course localization was not a problem. What was the challenge was after that, which was how do we take the large number of candidates and farm them out to all these different follow-up telescopes in the growth network to identify what these explosive transients are. Or um, as I like to call this uh, a funnel diagram, there were 2.1 million alerts. Alerts as in something that changed by more than five sigma in the, in the localization of the gravitational wave event a few hours, less than, less than 48 hours after merger. And we somehow had to take, actually, sorry, it was 72 hours after merger. Um, and then we had to take these 2.1 million candidates and go through different types of machine learning, different types of context information, light curve histories, et cetera, reduce that to 2,199 candidates. Do some additional analysis um, in the team that was up, up um, at night, our, our phones rang, we were actually awake um, and paying attention to each candidate coming out of the pipeline. And um, we were able to narrow this down to 127 candidates. These are our total numbers for all 13 events. Um, so over the course of 03, we announced 127 candidates, um, candidates to be followed up via GCM circulars. Then after uh, follow-up spectroscopy and follow-up photometry, both by the growth team and by other astronomers, um, GCM circulars are just public, completely public announcements uh, where you can put the coordinates and the information and then any astronomer that wants to follow up on it gets immediately notified and can collect, collect this precious information to tell us the nature of the transient. So we found all kinds of fun transients in this, um, in this, in this um, sifting through um, from 2.1 million to 127 candidates, but none of them showed features, um, spectroscopic features uh, that were consistent with um, the, any of the gravitational wave um, counterpart predictions. So we concluded there were exactly zero kilonovi despite all of that data in, in O3. So what do we learn from, from zero detections? Um, I think the first thing we learn is that we really need to do good statistics um, and figure out what is the probability of zero detections. If we were able to map these areas so efficiently and do a thorough search and systematic search and do it soon after the merger so that if there's any chance of a bright blue counterpart as there was for GW170817, the chances were that 96% that we would see something. There's less than 4% chance that we would see nothing um, in, in, in um, th for 13 events. 
And this is taking into account the fact that we can't map the whole area. Some parts of the area are in the south, weather, all those things, right? So if you take all of that into account. So what we can then do is, is ask the question of, okay, what is this upper limit telling us about the intrinsic luminosity function of, of kilonovi? Maybe not everything is um, like GW170817. So what we were able to constrain was the maximum fraction of bright kilonovi as a function of peak absolute magnitude for different assumptions about that early light curve. GW170817 was only found 10 hours later. So it's a bit of a guessing game on what happens in the first 10 hours. Um, and we find that it just could not be the norm, right? It, it, it does not, not all kilonovi are at least as bright as GW170817. Furthermore, um, regardless of whether the gravitational wave interferometers are online, we are able to search for kilonovi completely independently, um, especially if they're as bright as GW170817. Um, we can just search the entire uh, ZPF data set and see if there are any kilonovi in it. Um, and that search has also been very productive in finding all types of exciting um, fast transients for, which are not related to neutron star mergers, but has so far yielded zero kilonovi. So what that tells us is that it constrains the rate of these events to less than 900 per gigaparsec cube per year, which is consistent with the GWTC2 estimate at the, at the high end here. And as ZTF keeps running for a few years, depending on what the real number is for the underlying rate and the underlying luminosity function, uh, we will be able to get stricter and stricter constraints on this diagram. And this is uh, a new ZTF REST code written by Igor Andrioni and uh, Michael Coffin, who was a postdoc here, but is now faculty member at University of Minnesota. Okay, but that entire section about uh, GW170817 and ZTF searches in 03 did not have any infrared searches. And if these things are not like GW170817, but only have the red component and may not even have the blue component, there's even more urgency to solve the, the wide field and sensitive problem together. So I, so I was um, very motivated to build something that is more sensitive than, than Palomar Gattini IR and still has a large field of view. Um, and um, I'm going to skip this in the interest of time. Uh, these are, neut these are neut neutron star black hole mergers and some very nice searches um, from them. But the main point is still the same that uh, even for neutron star black hole mergers, the hallmark signature is a, is a very luminous infrared uh, counterpart. But I'm going to skip ahead to this piece, um, which is that um, uh, uh, Professor Rob Simcoe at MIT uh, was developing in gas semiconductors uh, and detectors, an alternative detectors in his lab and developing electronics for them and testing them on sky at Las Campanas. And they, they were very attractive because they were cheaper per pixel by a factor of several. And um, so um, in partnership with him, um, we are building a 1.1 uh, 1. 1 square degree camera on a one meter telescope. So one meter telescope is um, more than three times more apertures of three squares and more than nine times more sensitive than, than Gatini, um, also at Palmer Observatory. And this project is called Winter and it's fully funded. And the telescope is being shipped as we packed and shipped as, as we speak. And uh, we are hoping for first light um, later this year. And we also have a sister project because um, the game of gravitational wave counterpart searches always helps with some degeneracy in latitude and longitude. Uh, so we have a sister project um, at Siding Springs Observatory in Australia with my collaborator, Anna Moore, the same person um, I worked with for Gatini. Uh, and that's also funded, that's a dream surveyor. Uh, that will be at Siding Springs, and hopefully we'll have first light early 2022. So we are prepared for 04 and to, uh, to search for electromagnetic counterparts then. Now in the last couple of minutes here, um, I want to try and put all these pieces together. So not just do one piece of the science, but to do all the science that, that is exciting and more that is not even possible with the existing surveyors. And I want to solve both the problems, the detector cost problem and the sky background problem. Um, to be able to build a dream infrared surveyor. Um, and for that, um, I can't afford to go to space. That, that has too many zeros on the budget, um, but, I, but we can go to Antarctica. So I'd like to take you to Dome C on Antarctica, um, where here's a plot of um, the sky brightness as a function of wavelength. And there's a dip at 2.35 micron. This is the key dark band part where the sky is 40 times darker than any other mountain on Earth, whether be it Mauna Kea, be it uh, Serapachon on, um, in Chile, any mountain top, this is darker 
And so that means the noise is so much lower that you can build a sensitive telescope, much more sensitive telescope for the same aperture. Moreover, the seeing, which is the width of your, the full width half maximum of your point spread function is only a quarter arc second. So that is also improves your sensitivity very significantly. So what we are now working on is technology challenges. Um, in gas detectors, they're awesome, but they cut off at 1.7 micron. So, uh, so uh, Professor Don Feiger at, at RIT is developing something called MBE on silicon uh, detectors, which have very high QE uh, at 2.1 micron. And he has a new batch to try to push it to 2.35 micron. And Roger Smith is building a, um, a quarter scale prototype um, which is a fully cryogenic telescopeless detector system. Um, and if both of these work, then we have a, a real plan to uh, propose to build a full scale dream infrared surveyor in the Antarctic, hopefully before 05. So I'd like to summarize with this figure here. Um, this is a timeline of various projects um, that have helped to pry open the uh, dynamic infrared sky. And um, they, they all took a phased approach of one challenge at a time, one piece of the science at a time. Um, and all of this, I hope, will come together in this dream surveyor on, on the Antarctic. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your time and attention and take any questions. Yeah, so if people have questions, they can raise their hand or notify in the chat. See you, Winbin. Yeah, uh, uh, Nancy. So I have a question. So how does uh, JWST spectroscopic capability help us understand, like the the what are the elements synthesized during the merger? Um, for kilonovae or for stellar mergers? For kilonova. Oh, um, so um, if G JWST is actually quite sensitive, so it, it is capable of um, getting mid infrared spectra in the nebula phase. And um, there's a lovely paper by Kenta Hotikazaka, which actually makes firm predictions for what you may expect from these elements, given that there's a zoo of these elements um, and, uh, and an even bigger zoo of line transitions, what you could expect in the nebula phase. And um, that can help you disentangle whether there's neodymium or not, for example, um, as one of the lanthanides. Uh, but the paper's on archive now, so I encourage you to look at that um, for a closer uh, uh, look on theoretical predictions in the nebula phase with, with the James Webb Space Telescope. Thanks. So I'll ask Muncie, what is the planned field of view for your Australian cryogenic telescope? Um, Australian or Antarctic? Uh, or Antarctic, sorry. Antarctic, Antarctic uh, 50 square degrees, uh, 47, inspired by ZTF, <laughs> three more, 50 square degrees, one meter telescope. Um, so that uh, because um, even as localizations improve with gravitational wave interferometers, um, the problem is that not all the interferometers have the same sensitivity. So um, the larger field of view helps to just map the areas efficiently. And what we are targeting there is being able to detect neutron star black hole mergers out to 400 megaparsec. So we want to be as sensitive as um, 05 and maybe 06. Um, so thinking ahead to, to that type of sensitivity. Winter and dreams are matched to O4 sensitivity. Uh, so it can detect a GW17 or like event out to 190 megaparsec. But I'd like to push that, that horizon further in the Antarctic. All right, we have a question from Jim Fuller. Hi, Matsi, I have a question about your Novae. It looked like there was a high extinction tail it was mm -hmm. not predicted by the galactic extinction models. Can we learn anything from that? Um, I think the numbers are still small for that, Jim. Um, at, we presented our first 17 months of data, um, but I wouldn't take the, the tail too seriously until we have you know, firmer statistics um, in terms of the total numbers of Novi. Um, I think the rate number is, is, is serious and robust, but, but the shape of that of the tail, I would say we, we need to wait a few more years till we find a few more 
um, in the tail to be able to robustly infer anything from that. But okay, could but I? If it, <laughs> if it is there, could it be self-obscuring systems, something like that? Possibly, but uh, that would be cool, but <laughs> I wouldn't dare to make that claim just yet. Any additional questions? If not, you know where to find me. <laughs> My office is still Cahill 222, and I hope to be in it more <laughs> soon. <laughs> okay, well, if there are no more questions, let's uh, thank Monsi why. <clears throat> And we'll see you all next week. So thank you, Monsi. Thank you.